This weekend we're wandering around the Naropa campus, but uh, like the verses that apply to Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings, not all who wander are lost. One of the primary metaphors in Sufism is of the suluk, suluk, which means the journey. And so a Sufi is often called a salik, the one who takes the journey, the traveler. And the traveler too can seem to be wandering, to be lost. But, you know, unlike the sightseer or traveler to a city who is, you know, on a vacation, who knows exactly where they're going and what sights they want to see, the traveler on the path is following a different directional guide. And there's a homing beacon. The journey is home. The homing beacon is the heart. And so there's a way from the outside perspective a person can look to be wandering, who knows very well where they're going, how they're going to get there exactly, they don't exactly know. Uh, checking in with the heart again and again to find that road home. And the truth is, most of us wander out into life. And it really does start out as wandering. Uh, we come out of a womb. We take hesitant, stumbling steps, those first steps in those first years. And we mostly do that for a number of years going on. We take these hesitant, stumbling steps, and we fall into situations, and we stumble into catastrophes until we've wandered out into life far enough to question, how is it that I got here? Where am I? Like, it feels like we've wandered out very far. And at that point, the path really begins because now we're asking an authentic question. How did I get here? And whereas from birth until that point, we've mostly lived life on accident, just stumbling from one situation into the next, until we reach that point where we ask that question. How did I get here? And is, where is it that I'm really going? And it's because of this that we have words in, in our spiritual traditions like toba, teshuva, metanoia, which all get translated as repentance. But what they really mean is turning around. All of those words translate directly to turning around. And the sense is, and this is why they're connected to repentance, we feel like I've gotten lost. I've wandered out far, and I don't know how I got here, but I want to get somewhere on purpose now. And there's a sense of opportunity lost, things missed, mistakes made, and now I want to do this thing right. And so we turn around. And that's a metaphor, too, because the idea of turning around is the idea of going home. But the home to which we go is not necessarily the home from which we came. It's the true home. Sense of turning around to the true home, to the source. Maybe it's turning around to face our own hearts. The Sufi master Hazrat Anaya Khan says that initiation, baya it's called in Sufism, is a step in a direction one does not know. Initiation is a step in a direction one does not know. It's like we don't exactly know what we're doing. We don't know exactly where that path is going to lead. But we do trust that it's taking us home, maybe to a home unknown. He also follows that up by saying, the greatest initiation is to discover the heart. So maybe that's a clue. Maybe heart is the direction. So in Sufism, 
we have a number of practices for discovering the heart. The primary practice is called vikra, or as we say it more in, in English, zikr. And the word means remembrance. And I want to introduce us to this practice in the way that it's done in my lineage. And then we'll begin another phase of the journey, but sitting. So I'm going to come down here. So zikr in Sufism is basically a mantric practice, a practice of repeating a sacred phrase again and again to get it moving in consciousness. Um, this could be any of a number of phrases, but within any Sufi lineage, uh, no matter you know what Sufi lineage you belong to, you will say one particular phrase, and it's la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, and you might recognize that as the um, primary creedal statement of Islam. There's no god but God. <clears throat> Sufis also say it. Um, perhaps with a, a different sense in mind. But in every Sufi lineage, there's a way of saying that phrase and expressing it in zikr that is unique. It's, it's part of the character of each lineage to say it in a particular way. And so there's an understanding that perhaps you know, the, the phrase as it's attached to Islam represents the, the notion of tawhid. Tawhid in Arabic means unity. And, and when, when a Muslim speaks of Tawhid, they're talking about the unity of God, that there's one God, the oneness of God, the oneness of our relationship to God. And in the era in which the Prophet Muhammad uh, came to uh, bring this message of Tawhid, um, in the seventh century, in, in what is now the Arabian, or <laughs> what was then the Arabian Peninsula, it's still the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but he gave it over in a time when the dominant uh, religion of the period in that place was polytheistic and animistic and polydemonism, all these different things fused together and so when he came with this message, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God, in some ways it was an innovation to say, uh, not these many gods, there's one God. And from one perspective, we might like the idea of many gods. Um, and even the, the polydemonism, the many spirits, um, that sounds like a fantastic universe to us. I, I like it myself, like, you know, the god of the rocks over here, the, the spirit that inhabits the river over here, all of those things. It's, it's great. And, and they were a tribal people, and they had different gods that they honored. And in this city that's called Mecca, um, there was a house for all of these gods. And really, it, it's described as having 360 gods in a circle within this house that is, you know, today still stands called the Kaaba. But then it was a house of many gods. And that sounds great. But the way it works out with people is not always so great. So the way the polytheism of that time uh, worked out is a lot of one-upsmanship, just the way we see now. It's, but it was kind of like, you know, my God is better than your God. You know, we worship this God. And everybody, you know, they're pounding the table. No, over here, we worship this God. And it divided the peoples of Arabia. So there's a sense in which when the Prophet Muhammad came with la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God, it was, it was a 
a kind of a unifying idea. In fact, in his final sermon, he says, you know, basically, you're no longer tribal people separated by your tribes, but you are one people under one God. So you see, it was meant as, as a message of unity and to unify a people that were really divided by their gods, just as, in some sense, we are today peoples divided by our gods, and maybe there are fewer of them, or I think it may be more appropriate to say divided by our religions, since they're all believe, you know, most of them are believing they're worshiping the same God, and are somehow still divided in that. So this is how this was meant. But among Sufis, it's said that there was an inner tradition uh, another understanding to the words, la ilaha illallah. There's no God but God. And for some Sufis, that was read as, instead of no God but God, there's nothing but divinity. And that was an inner understanding that Sufis say was taught to closer disciples who had the capacity to understand such a message. There's nothing but divinity. Also in Sufism, we say that the phrase can be broken up into four parts. Two parts first. La ilaha, no God. Illallah, nevertheless, God. No God, nevertheless, God. And so it's a, um, a kind of coming together of two aspects of our experience of life. On the one hand, uh, not through a telescope, not under a microscope, not under the rug, we don't find God. At, at some point in time, some peoples might have had a thought that somewhere out in space, out behind the moon, maybe there's God, you know, a big being out there watching over us, and, and now we've stretched out into that universe, and we keep stretching out into that universe, and into the micro-universe, and we don't find this God. And that's a part of our experience in the objective universe, in the universe of science and reason, that we don't find that God. And this is something that is reckoned in the Sufi tradition that one aspect of our experiences of human beings is of not finding God. Looking and not finding. And having to um, deal with that disappointment. Um, because you get in enough trouble in your life, you'll reach out for something, somewhere, and you'll want an answer from that God, you know, that you hope has a voice that reaches out back to you and who you hope in that moment embraces you and lifts you up out of that difficult moment. And, and so I think there's a very basic human disappointment in that not finding. And in Sufism, that's just kind of owned. La ilaha, no God, there is no God. And I, I suppose if that's where it ended, that wouldn't be much of a tradition. <laughs> it wouldn't be Sufism. Maybe that's just atheism. I don't know. There's actually a funny story of, um, of a Sufi master who was, um, some Sufi masters are said to be majdub, intoxicated, God intoxicated, so much so that they've lost their reason and they do kind of strange, you know, uh, things that kind of put them on the edge of society. And one such master called Sarmad would go wandering, because he's a Salik, a traveler, right? And he's wandering with his, with his beads. La ilaha, la ilaha, la ilaha, la ilaha, la ilaha, la ilaha, la ilaha. And at a certain point, another Sufi stops and says, brother, you're just saying no God. No God, you know, there's more to the phrase. Illallah. 
And he just said, I'm not there yet. <laughs> no God, no God, no God. I'll tell you when I get there. Interesting follow-up on that story. They say that when Sarmad uh, died and he was executed for heresy, <laughs> when they cut his head off, sorry, <laughs> and the little head rolled, the mouth opened and said, illallah. Nevertheless, God. <laughs> so apparently he got there at that, that moment. So to come back, though, we reckon this into our experience. We're just honest about it. There's, there's a human experience of not finding. And we don't want to wash over it. No, 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 really, there's God. Everything's great. It's all meaningful. No, that's not all of our experience. But neither is no God all of our experience. There is illallah, nevertheless God. So it's kind of like la ilaha semicolon, nevertheless God. And that nevertheless God is something, now not everybody feels like they can get there. Like what is that nevertheless God? I know, no God. And I sometimes think that that has a lot to do with that experience of not knowing what's on the other side of that semicolon is about our own poverty of language around s sacred things and spirituality, even the word sacred. Like there's some people who say to me, like, I don't know from sacred, what, what's sacred? I don't get that. But I think, again, that's, that's, that's a poverty of expression. Like, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's somebody out there, but if you've ever been handed a, no, a newborn and know how your hands almost tremble with the responsibility of holding this thing, which is too precious to drop, you know a little bit about sacred. And maybe you change the word. Maybe it's precious and you mean it, you know? It's too precious to drop. Um, there are moments that are sacred, moments of intimacy between two people. Uh, when somebody gives you their trust or their heart, sacred. And it's a sacred responsibility. And often we flunk in that responsibility, but it is a sacred responsibility. And there's no doubt about it when you're in it. So I think we have to expand our notions of what, what this means. And, you know, I like to say, God is just a name tag on the infinite. You know, it doesn't mean anything to call the infinite any particular name. So it's just like trying to pin that on, you know, something, it just floats away. And yet it's still on the infinite. So sometimes it's more helpful to adjust the language to sacred. You know, say there's no, no deity, no, well, there's no overarching God in Buddhism, but there is sacred. And so, you know, we can get together on this thing, but we have to expand into a notion of knowing what is sacred. And we have this experience, no God, and that represents um, a kind of objective view of the universe. Uh, now, I won't say that's truly objective because I don't think we're actually capable of objectivity. There's no proof that we're objective at all. Uh, we make a noble attempt at it, and I think it is a noble attempt, but I think we're fools if we think that we're actually objective. We, we make that attempt, and then we make some strides in knowledge because of that attempt. But that's only uh, you know, one part of our experience, that attempt to be objective and to find and to search honestly with integrity. And then we have this other thing called subjective experience, an experience that I have that you will never know. And the illallah, the nevertheless God, is a lot on that side. Um, and it's, it's something that we often talk about, you know, with the word faith. Faith is not belief. That's a misuse of the word. Um, 
faith, in the words of um, the philosopher Martin Buber, would be more accurately described as holy insecurity. Holy insecurity. Uh, which is to say it's insecure knowledge. It's not knowledge that I can prove to you. I can't prove it to you, but I can't deny it to myself. That's what faith is. That I have experiences which I can't demonstrate to you their truth or what happened or how it felt. And yet, I can't deny it to myself. I can try, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing. And a lot of our experiences of the sacred fall into that category. And they might be what I experienced during a walk in the woods one day, what I experienced in a kiss, and, and it might have been sacred and holy and bigger than in dimension than what many people I know would give credit to. And yet, for me, I know what I felt. I just can't demonstrate it to you. And so that's a faith. Holy insecurity. It's holy, but it's insecure because I just, I like, I can't, you know, I can't put markers in the ground and prove it to you. I can't take a picture of it. And so, basically, la ilaha illallah is expressing a very human tension of negation and affirmation. And it's the two uh, th that unite different elements of our being. And we meet in the center, hopefully. You know, sometimes we just fall on one side or the other, but that's not it either. You know, that is not the spiritual path. Uh, that is not even life. If we just go with a negation, then you're denying your subjective experiences of beauty and passion and and preciousness. And then some people are all on, on the good side, you know. It's all beautiful, it's all meaningful, and you want to smack them sometimes. It's not. There's plenty of ugly. And so this, this is trying to get it together. And when it gets it together, then it achieves that meaning, there's nothing but divinity. In the beauty and the ugliness. All divine. All together. One experience just life. I'm among those people that like, I only speak about spirituality grudgingly. I don't like the word. Uh, I have to speak about spirituality because there are reductive materialists in the world who just want to reduce everything down to material. And I, I just think that that's short-sighted. Uh, like the one thing you should be able to say in truth in life is, I don't know. I don't know where the boundaries of life are. I don't know where things end. It's big. And I'm within it. It's not within me. Like if I surrounded it, you know, maybe I'd be God and I'm the master of all knowledge. But I'm within it. And so I don't, I don't know where things end. So I, I'm not down with reductive materialism. They force me to talk about spirituality. The problem with talking about spirituality is that it suggests that there are two things. There's like non-spiritual and spiritual. And for me, I would rather just say there's just life. There's life in all its possibilities and its range of possibility. And it's up to you how much you're going to allow in and be open to that range of possibility. So I would rather talk about life, but you know, because there's people that want to deny an aspect of it, then I end up talking about spirituality. <clears throat> but when we get this, this negation and affirmation together, what we're really talking about is life as a, an experience of remarkable possibility. Uh, life as divinity, in a way. That's like a huge prologue to a practice. <laughs> which I'm going to make a little bit longer, <laughs> even in my description of the practice. Um, but it, it's a way of saying there's a lot layered into a practice. 
And so all Sufis will say that phrase. Uh, almost all Sufis have a sense of those meanings that are put in it. You can find that across many different books and teachings. Uh, the oldest part of my lineage comes out of Central Asia, and it's called the Chishti lineage. Um, Sufi lineages either get named after a particularly charismatic teacher who brings an innovation into it, or they get named kind of randomly after a town where it kind of got started. And mine gets named after a little town, <laughs> this is a village really called Chisht, Chisht. Uh, which is still a, a little city that exists in, now in what is Afghanistan. So the way the, the zikr is done in the Chishti lineage is like this. It's broken into four parts, and we move from the left shoulder and hinge at the waist, and this is important so that you're not straining your neck. You hinge at the waist, and you drop down and roll over the right shoulder until you're facing the sky. And as you do that, you say, La ilaha, there is no God. Then from up here, looking at the sky, we drop down into the belly and say, Illa, nevertheless. From here, we lift up, looking again straight at the sky and say, La, God. The Arabic for God is La. Allah is the God. So Al is really a definite article appended to La, God. And then as we move from the top, where we come down as if magnetically drawn to the heart, and say, Who? Now, I've been talking about La ilaha illa La. But here we're extending a little bit off of the H of la and making another word who. And who in Sufism is, is a funny word. It's, it literally means something like he or he-ness. But in Sufism, in Arabic rather it does, but in Sufism it's kind of code for the divine feminine, which is to say the experiential aspect of God. Uh, the fragrance of God, the felt sense of, everything material and feelable, even if that is in a sensory experience that kind of goes beyond what can be touched. All of those aspects of divinity are seen as the divine feminine and their locus is in the heart. So we go from talking about God to trying to experience God and the place of experiencing God is in the heart. And so the movements again are from the left shoulder. La ilaha illa la hu. There is no God. Nevertheless, God is. And I love this because, you know, uh, a lot of people when they think of Sufism, they think of the whirling dervishes from Rumi's order who whirl and circumambulate uh, a central figure which represents the sun and they're like the planets uh, uh, spinning on their axis but also moving around a greater body. And that greater body is Rumi himself or the sheikh or the pole of spirituality and the dervishes whirl around but this idea of whirling or circumambulation or circling exists in all the Sufi lineages. In my lineage, it's represented in these movements. And the pole or axis is, is the center of one's being. And we're circumambulating the kaaba of the heart or the center of, of the being. And they're lovely, elegant movements. And I think of them as kind of like the prayer of the body. Uh, sometimes in zikr, the words will fall away, but the body might keep doing these movements. And part of the beauty of the movements is that they go with the words. So, la ilaha, there is no God. So from here, down and around and spiraling up, 
It represents the journey out into the world, the looking for God in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces. Anybody's ever heard that old song? But basically the same thing. We're looking for meaning outside of ourselves. We're looking for love and validation outside of ourselves in all the wrong places. We do it because uh, we almost can't not. You know, we're, we're designed, uh, some people might be upset with this, but basically as predators, as, as we look at predators with eyes forward, we're set up like this. Um, the predator watches, targets, goes after. So we see things on the horizon and we go after them. It's not a bad thing, but it does tend to tell us that everything of value is outside of myself. Everything I want to get is outside of myself, even God. And that leads to a kind of disappointment. So that's the first stage of the spiritual journey looking for God in all the wrong places, <laughs> the external search. What that eventually does is leads to great disappointment. Finally, it's like, God, where are you? And I like to say, if there's any value to the kind of pain that we go through in this world, or like any justification for it, for all the hurts, it's that it drives us inward. It makes us finally introspective, reflective. And so we go from the external search, la ilaha, there is no God, to illa, nevertheless. And that's, now I'm going to go inside. And it's that, that look, you know, that you see in somebody that, you know, is going through something. And they may be looking down, eyes open, but you know they're not looking at anything. It's an interior look. And that's us starting to get wise. Like, it's not out there. What's going on in me? Why are these things happening again and again? We go inside, and that's of great value because in there we discover ourselves. And so, illa. Now we find something of value that doesn't come from outside, comes from inside. And when we discover it, we have this moment. La. It's as if buoyed up. The internal discovery is inspiring. You know, it lifts us up. And we say, God. It's like the God within. I discovered my God. I discovered what my values were, what my joy is. And we lift up with it. <coughs> And that is a kind of God, but it's your God. It's not God. It's like, that's the God at which I worship. That's my, um, it's like my local post office. <laughs> it's like, that's the one I'm going to go to, okay, you know, because it's convenient and I have a relationship with it and I know the people there. So the God that we discover inside is a reflection of our own ideal being ourselves in a way, at our best, you know, like the template of our being and all our possibility, we witness within as our God possibility. And uh, Sufi master in my lineage calls that the God ideal. But that's an also ultimately an idol that needs to be broken. That's your God ideal. And it's still an abstraction or an idea. You haven't reached God yet. You've reached a good mask of God for you. The final stage of the journey is to find God in experience, not in idea or ideals. And that can be only be found in the heart. That God is only found in the heart. And so we finally come down and say, who? The experiential presence of God. So you see, just doing the movements, even without the words, articulate the spiritual journey. Looking for God in all the wrong places, the pain of that exterior search driving us inward, discovering ourselves and our own ideals, which we lift up as a kind of God ideal, and then even breaking that idol 
and trying to find God and experience in truth down in the heart, the only place it can be found. And the rhythm of this is like knocking on the door of the heart and begging it to open. And so this is the process of zikr and what's layered in it, into it in my lineage, and then there's nothing to do but to do it. So we'll do a round of it together. Sufis don't usually do less than 99, and since this is a practice weekend, we'll do 99 and not shortchange ourselves. And part of the practice it is to do it with focus and intention and even feeling into the journey. So the, the part of the journey that is there is no God, there's an ache in the words and in how you say them. La ilaha illa la. Inspiration in the la coming back up. Who? So let's do a full round of these together. Starting at the left shoulder. La la. Dropping down. Illa. Coming up with inspiration. La. Whatever that is for you. Who? La la. Illa. La. Who? La ilaha illa la who? La ilaha illa la who? La ilaha. There is no God. Illa. Nevertheless. La God. Who is. La ilaha. Illa. La. Who. La ilaha. Illa la hu la ilaha 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 illa la who la ilaha illa la who la ilaha illa la who la ilaha Illa la hu 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 la ilaha illa la 
ಹು ಲಾಹು 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 
ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ಲಾಹಿಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ದ ಜರ್ನಿ ಲಾಹಿಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಇಸ್ ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು 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 ಲಾಹಿಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹಿಲ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹು ಲಾಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲಾಹ
illa la hu I don't know if any of you experience this, but often on the tail end of a zikr practice, there's a presence, uh, a quality in the air around you. And it's almost better than the whole practice just to be a moment in that cultivated presence after the practice. And, and sometimes that's what we're talking about with who, that experiential presence, which you can um, enrich in the space around you and then dwell in and then know an experience of reality that is just different, a little different. Sometimes the practice becomes soft and breathy. And that connects for Sufis to you know, what was in the past, a kind of secret teaching. Uh, that the, the word God, God in Arabic, Allah, uh, was seen as code. And there was encoded in it a secret message. So the Arabic of Allah has four letters, an alif, like an A, a lam, a lam, and a ha. So A-L-L-H, basically. And, and Sufis would say that the first A and the L together make al, the definite article, the, or the. And then in Arabic, when you have two of the same letter together, a lam and a lam, no, it signals an intensification of the meaning of any word. Whatever the word meant, if you added two letters together in there, it meant more of that, a little more intense. So Sufi so say you have the al, the al, the definite article, the or the, Lam Lam, the very <sighs> breath, that's the H. God, Allah, is the very breath, the subtle essence that pervades and penetrates all things. And so sometimes we emphasize the breath. It's our deepest connection to divinity, the most subtle essence within us that's connecting all things and in which we're held. So that's the basic practice of zikr. 